celebrate the Lord. Come on. We celebrate your name, God. Yeah, yeah. Let's declare you are. You are. Uh, our doors are very loud. Uh, the exits that we would like for you to use are on the far ends 
of the auditorium. Um, flash photography and video recorders can actually interfere with our singers' concentration, and we ask that you please avoid this while they're performing. We want you to enjoy your evening, and these behavior expectations will only help in that, and we appreciate your support on that one as well. Um, after our choral portion is completed, we're going to have about a 10 minute intermission to prepare for the solo and ensemble participants. If your student is not involved in this, you are free to end your evening with us and go home. The second half really is quite lengthy, but you're also encouraged to stay if you'd like to as well. Um, we're going to begin our uh, choral portion of the concert. The four pieces tonight highlight the two most prominent features in February, celebrating African American History Month and celebrating Valentine's Day. Our first piece tonight is on the Valentine's Day side of our February, uh, entitled Come to Me, Oh My Love, accompanied by choir member Tiger and Wernkia. Please enjoy our first piece of the evening. during a massive drought. Please enjoy your second piece, Fan and Song. Thank you for your donation. 
Congratulations to Deb Casello, who got the I Love Coffee gift basket. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, congratulations, David Wright. You have won the Chocolate Decadence basket. And congratulations, Jeanette Jones. You have won the Valentine's gift basket. Good job. Thank you very much. And we have another chocolate decadence gift basket that goes to Tim Silball. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys again for coming out. We're going to do about a 10 minute intermission uh, to get ready for the solo and ensemble participants. If you plan on staying, uh, we would really appreciate it. The closer that you guys get to the stage, if you plan on staying, actually the better for the singers. Uh, thank you again so much for coming out and supporting West Choir. We really appreciate it and have a great time. It's more intimate. And again, you know, the people in the back, please feel free to come forward. It's actually a lot easier for, for our solo singers to not feel like they have to sing way on back there. But uh, the rest of the evening is going to be mostly student directed. Thank you. <laughs> Students, that's you that I'm leaving. Uh, the rest of the evening, like I said, is going to be pretty much student directed. Each, per each performer will come up to the stage, they'll introduce themselves, they'll introduce their piece, and they'll introduce their accompanist. Um, and this is all in preparation for the regional festival that's going to be happening at the end of the month. Students? Uh, students are hoping to be able to qualify for the state festival in May with this regional festival. Uh, we ask that you once again be wonderful audience members. Um, that includes you. Uh, but this is a pretty difficult thing that they're, that they're attempting to do for you guys. And uh, Every student's kind of on a different level for their preparation. Uh, some will be using music and some will not. Again, this is more just a snapshot of the work that they've done since January. Um, but the Solo and Ensemble Festival will be on February 28th. Parents are always encouraged to come and support their kids and to come and support West. But we'll go ahead and get things rolling with uh, Jeremy and Courtney. Anyways, amen? 
So we're going to go inside and we're just going to learn a little bit of history about Mr. Cornelius's legacy here in Alaska. Inside of Mr. Cornelius's Auto Alaska. Uh, it was a little risky outside, but we wanted to keep the people to get a view of what his business looks like on the outside. So if you happen to pass by, you can come on in and be blessed by his business. Amen. So at this time, I would like you to formally introduce yourself to the audience. My name is Cornelius Curry, <clears throat> and I've uh, been in Anchorage for some time now. And uh, Basically, been here on this corner. Started uh, this little car dealership back in around 2006. Uh, in the back here, which you may have a chance to show you later, okay. where there was a the Easy Inn Hotel, which mm -hmm. many of you probably remember, and uh, purchased that uh, and pretty much demolished it and turned it into a car lot, and, and uh, eventually uh, expanded. To where I'm at now, and then purchased this uh, building here that we're presently sitting in, mm -hmm. and was uh, blessed to be able to uh, get this place. And uh, I've been here for a little bit now. So, amen. So, Mr. Cornelius, were you born in Alaska, or no. were you you came here at a later date? Or tell us a little bit about your heritage. Uh, here in Alaska, and what brought you here, or was it your family, or did you just migrate here? Was it your military, or you just wanted to come north to Alaska? Just give us a little bit of history on that. Well, actually, my dad came up here first, and there were uh, seven of us at one time uh, that lived all in Washington mm -hmm. state. My dad migrated from Georgia up to Washington, mm -hmm. and with having so many kids, he was a block layer and a cement finisher. Wow. Having so many kids, uh, the further he moved north, the more money he could make. Mm. Instead of making 45 cents an hour, he might make 80 cents an hour. So what era was that? Well, for him, uh, he was born in 1910. Uh-huh. And uh, I'm the youngest of... Uh, seven. Mm -hmm. and there's one sister under me, so the rest of them are older than me. So basically from basically him uh, being born in 1910 and basically moving to Washington in the uh, late or early 50s possibly. Oh, okay. And uh, he's uh, moved there, which is a little bit, in fact, he uh, worked on the, uh, uh, the dam there that was in Oregon for a while before he actually moved to Washington. So where I was actually born, and my other sister was actually born there uh -huh. in the state of Washington. So. Mm -hmm. And so he, he found that back in at that in during those years that they were needing people up in Alaska to, to you know to help build uh, the barracks out there in Fort Ridge and the wow. site up on the mountain there where near Eagle River. Sometimes you look up and see that big globe. It looks like a big uh, sphere up there on the mountain. That they had helped build that uh, foundation for that and other things so there. So you helped build the base, the military. Exactly. Wow! Right, right out there in Fort Ridge when they were. These so about there. what year was that? When he well, he had came up in '49, and so he used to work right here in Alaska, mm -hmm. and then he'd come back to Washington. And I then, see. You know, went back and forth. Yes. Like he'd move, come up here and work, mm -hmm. and as long as he could. Sometimes he'd work through the winter because they could uh, cover things or put plastic over. The jobs and maybe on air, airplane hangers, and, and then he'd come back to Washington. Wow. So that was just basically his uh, how that type of uh, work was. It was more work in the summer, sort of like kind of like transient workers, exactly. like we have now. There are some people that work on the pipeline exactly. and so they right. live in another state, they'll come here maybe two weeks or 30 days or three months and then they go back exactly. to where they live because the economics in their area is not so great. Right. So it was a similar situation. Right, so he worked up here a number of years and then mm -hmm. uh, and, and he uh, passed in uh, last year, <clears throat> and uh, in, in June 4th of last year. So if it's not too personal, uh, how old was he? What uh, he, age? Well, he, was, he would have been 104. Uh, 104? Yes. That is 
is awesome. Well. And so that's why I always tell people, you know, uh, hard work uh, yeah. hurt you because uh, it helped him to live a long time. So that's a legacy. You know, and, and <laughs> wow. Work. Yeah. Yeah, and so <clears throat> he basically, I'd say, uh, I learned to trade from him uh, mm -hmm. doing construction and eventually some of me and my brother's uh, sister, some of us, you know, moved to Alaska and eventually uh, uh, I started my business here, mm -hmm. and uh, not here in particular, but here in Anchorage. Yes. In 82, I started a uh, construction company mm -hmm. known as CMB Backhaul Service. It was a spiritually inspired uh, mm -hmm. company. Yes. And the Lord uh, basically blessed me to come uh, to have a, a foresight that uh, the name it CMB Backhaul, yes. and basically we established ourselves in 82. And, and from there, pretty much, uh, I eventually, uh, you know, we got into construction, doing paving, and mm -hmm. uh, build homes, and uh, uh, foundations for homes, and do uh, water and sewer, mm -hmm. do a lot of asphalt work, and and so <clears throat> that led me eventually to uh, to where I'm at now. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the year 2006. There's a building behind me here. It used to be the old Easy Inn. I think I mentioned that earlier. Yeah, that and it was a hotel a with a 16 uh, rooming room. Uh, uh, sort of like inn a boarding there. house. Right, boarding oh, house. Oh. Had a few violations there, and the, the city wanted it either uh, fixed up or torn down. And the, mm -hmm. the owner basically called me out of the yellow pages, basically under demolition, because part of my business was demolition and, yes. and construction. To give an estimate on tearing it down, or and he got another estimate for from an engineer to fix it up. So he was trying to teeter between which way would work for him the best, or which would be more economical. And yeah. somehow we ended up figuring, well, if I bought the building, I could tear it down for less, and he could save money, and you know, and make money at the same time. So, God just opened up that yeah. door and created uh, that avenue uh, of a blessing. Yeah, it was a blessing. For what blessing. your vision was with the car, exactly. it was a car um, dealership. Right, and at that time, actually, I was leasing a place out on the uh, old sewer between mm -hmm. Huffman and the uh, and then Platt uh -huh. from a friend of mine who had a hot dog stand out there, mm -hmm. and he was able to uh, uh, rent me uh, about five spaces, mm -hmm. and I paid by the week. Mm -hmm. So when this opportunity came up, I knew it was a blessing because now I would have my own place and yes. pay many cars as I like. Yes. And so eventually I tore the building down and I was there several years here in the back mm -hmm. and the motor home is my office. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I had now opportunity. that's a testimony. Oh, yeah, because that. when you're determined, no matter what, you made a portable office. There are a lot of places that do have portables. Yes. Uh, the metal buildings that they move from different place to place. Yes. Uh, but you created an office with the RV. Yes. And it was... Perfect. Perfect. That was a blessing that it all worked out and then eventually, uh, Lord bless me, an uh, opportunity came that I was able to purchase this building here, which yes. uh, in, in a sense gave me even a uh, better opportunity mm -hmm. uh, in the car business because now I'm more exposure I'm mm -hmm. out in the corner here. And like I said, it's all in, in, in God's plans, you know, yes. like I say, from when he first blessed me with C&B, like I said, was spiritually inspired. And, and he gave me the name, yes. and uh, he said that he was blessing. He's blessed me, you know, and uh, and those around me and family-wise, and yes, and I give him all the glory. Amen. Now, when let's kind of, I want to back up just a little bit. Now, when the vision came for the car lot, was that your third uh, blessing that God gave you as far as creating wealth, or was it? Your second? It was a third. Third. Yeah, because it was kind of like having a structure business, being having equipment, and I started uh, building homes in Wasilla because mm -hmm. I figured that'd be another source of income. And yes. at the time, they were talking about building a bridge across the the, uh, the uh, river here downtown. I'm over. still believing it's going to come. Yeah. <laughs> I want to build a house over there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I bought some land out there in anticipation of, of the. Uh, bridge being built and the ferry being done, but besides that, either way, it was still an investment yes, yes. in land, and that's something my dad taught me years ago, that land, yes. you know, they're not making no more of that. They yes. make a lot of things, but they can't make land, so you know, yes. get as much of that as you can while, you know, while it's here. 
and I was able to build a few homes out there. I built two homes out there, and and, and I had bought lots for building a couple more. And at that time, in between the interim on that, I ended up with the, as I said, the Easy Inn. I started the car dealership. Mm -hmm. So I was working the car dealership for a few years before I could get back out there and build another home. Mm -hmm. So eventually I built a third home. Mm -hmm. And now I'm kind of trying to find time now to get back up there and build a fourth one that I awesome. said I was going to do. So if the Lord will, yes. I'll get my fourth house going here and I have a lot next to one of the other two houses I built. It's pretty much, I've got it pretty much prepared to build on, but now it's finding the time or finding if it's God's will that I even need the time. So, yes. Uh, so had you, have you been um, instrumental in areas of reaching out to the community as far as, say, helping people, um, volunteers uh, for either of your companies, uh, trying to show young people or even adult people that might have just turned the wrong way in life and they're trying to get back on their feet. Have you been uh, involved in any programs as far as some type of volunteer to let people see that there's another way of life than the way that they've been living or open up new avenues for them? Well, I have hired people over the years to work for me in my construction business. Every summer I've got either new people calling to work or some have been with me for for many years. Well, a couple awesome. guys. Then I've had uh, my two boys, mm -hmm. and they've worked with me since they were little little kids, and they've grown either to get their own own businesses or either they uh, like the other one's been to he's become a civil engineer this past mm -hmm. year. So so they pretty much have uh, passed the tradition on from yes. my dad. So from the sons, I kind of took off where you know. I'm leaving off or where I'm at now and I, you know, I think get all the glory to God and my dad having the foresight to yes. come to Alaska and eventually yes. we you know what we followed and found that it was a good place if a person was looking to yes. do something in in a constructive manner. Yes. That uh, I believe there's plenty of opportunity here and I don't think there's any excuse for failure yes. in my opinion. Amen. Because it's such a wide open country, so I can tell us a person can pretty much make it yes. here if they want to. Yes. So. Now there have been some sayings, you know, uh, with families sometimes. Uh, say it's a struggle sometimes to work with family. Uh, how has your experience been working with your family? Well, I, since I raised my my family, I. I basically started out young to understand that there was no free ride yes. in the world. Exactly. You know, whether it was picking up your toys or yes. whether it was making your bed up or yes. whether it's taking your plate off the table. So they, they learned pretty young and some of them teasing me about it now. I, I always thought I was kind of tough on them back then, but you know, I've had some of them say that they really kind of come to appreciate me because mm -hmm. they see the world is tough. Yes. And so now they see that uh, they could handle me, they see that they can handle the world. So Amen. I told them well, that was my whole uh, point from the beginning, to yes. make it tough enough where when you went into the world, you, you would already be prepared. And mm -hmm. So that's how God blessed me to think. And yes. I see that it's, you know, it's paid off and with, with all of them, are, are all of them are industrious, and they've yes. all uh, basically have uh, done well. Amen. And, uh, and uh, in all I look and say, you know, that they're you know, it's a blessed Amen. family. You know. Amen. And my mom has basically uh, helped nurture them, and I was able to be the, you know, whatever I needed to be as the yes. father. Amen. She was on the tough side. Yes. Yeah. Amen. I know at uh, one point um, I had a business uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, and my husband and I was trying to convince him to come to work with me. I had a beauty college, and I enrolled people, and I trained them. Um, how to do hair and all of the facets in the beauty industry. And my husband, uh, he was, you know, you have a balance. Right. You have one person that's the go-getter and you have one person that likes dealing with the office side and paperwork. And my husband, he tried it for a spell with me and, and uh, we kind of clashed a little. I said, okay, you stay in the office and I stay over here. Uh, can you handle these registrations and while I do this and so I was trying to stay out of his way, he was trying to stay out of my way to still make it, you know, make the business flow. And 
so we, we had a few challenges in the beginning, but we had never worked together before. So it was an experience. So we learned how to adjust and work together like this is business. We were, we're husband and wife, but this is business, you know, and we have to conduct ourselves as business people yes. in the work environment exactly. and know how to differentiate. And so um, it turned out pretty good after a while. Then God sent us, he brought us to Alaska as well to start some new adventures here. But um, now with your, um, with your business here in Anchorage, um, how would you say you've uh, been very successful but you say you have a backhoe business, uh, you build homes, uh, now you have a car lot. Do you have any other um, ideas that are on the horizon that you might uh, try? Well, most of anything I may do may be in conjunction with some of the things I already have here, like I have a unit next door here. I've thought of uh, turning that into some type of a, uh, a meeting hall mm -hmm. somewhat where people could possibly come and mm -hmm. maybe if the uh, what you call a hockey mom might want to give a trophy out yeah. to, the, to the boys or mm -hmm. someone want to do a meeting yes. here or maybe even do a wedding next door yeah. so I haven't really quite uh, solidified exactly that what you want to do thought that. but like yeah. I say there's the scripture say you know if, uh, you know <laughs> Acknowledge the Lord in all your ways that He would direct your path. Amen. And so I figure if it's His will, uh, you know, whatever it is, so mm -hmm. it come to pass. So, Mr. Cornelius, um, if there's something that you would like to inspire to, say, young people or, say, people that might have went the wrong way in life, uh, could be ex felons or it could be anybody, they feel hopeless and they feel they can't make it. Is it something you might be able to share with the viewing audience uh, that can encourage them to let them know uh, you can do anything in life that you want to do no matter what? You can just kind of maybe share a little bit of your testimony and share. Well, I tell you, I can say that uh, through Christ you can, uh, I can do all things, mm -hmm. you know. And I do know that because I walked into a church in 1982 as a basically a pool hustler and a, running a street light to the street in the world that way and God basically uh, spoke to my heart and uh, he saved me and it was uh, and he's the one that basically told me I put the pool stick down and a lot of other things I was doing that he would uh, bless me with uh, just like the Bible says and uh, and uh, I was Right there at Antioch, right there on the corner, I walked in there on Easter Sunday, and, and uh, basically God's been He's been uh, working on me ever since. Yes. And He basically blessed me, like I say, to get a business. And mm -hmm. He said, "If you put the pool stick down, He said, I'll take care of you." And I thought, I said, "Well, I'm gonna trust God." Amen. And here I am, all these years later. Yes. And He said, "If any man basically follows Him and put down." His God, that was yes. my God, the pool stick. Yes. He said, follow him, mm -hmm. and, you know, the Lord Jesus. He said, I will bless him 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 fold, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever necessary or whatever he decides to do. He said, I'll bless him with home and cattle and land. Yes. And, and all the things that I own today is basically as a testimony from from. God speaking to me and, and me accepting yes. him as my personal savior and even though we stumble even as we find uh, the Lord he said a man can fall seven times he said a yes. righteous man will fall seven times and yes. he'll get up again yes. because he knowing whom he believe and he's persuaded that mm -hmm. if Jesus Christ Amen. is able to do Yes, exceedingly yes. above that that we even ask or even believe, think sometimes mm -hmm. and I know that that's a fact mm -hmm. and God basically been with me every ever since and, mm -hmm. and sometimes we have to be like Peter we can see where we go wrong and we just have to mm -hmm. break down and cry a little bit and say yes. God give me the strength to do better yes. mm -hmm. and God sees us 
and even in our weakness, he said in your weakness, he said uh, uh, his strength is made perfect. Yes. So it's not our strength, but it's his and our in our weakness that we allow his strength to make us and to carry us and to build us and take us where we need to go. It ain't no shame in falling. Fall, falling. It ain't no. But it, but when you get up, that's a testimony. God wants you to be able to tell Thank that you got up because you know in whom you believe and you know that it's not of us but Thank it's of him and that's his power and, and it was that that I live on and stand on and and God is real yes he is that's, say God is real Amen. well at this time uh, Mr. Cornelius if you would uh, maybe render Maybe a short word of encouragement or a short prayer to the viewing audience that someone may be watching and feeling like they're down on their luck and they just feel like it's no hope. They don't know what to do. They don't feel good enough. They don't feel worthy. Uh, what would you suggest as a prayer to uplift them? Because you know, as a testament, what could you say to a person that's feeling down on their luck? I can say that if you really want to change, and you seriously want to change, mm -hmm. God will help you change. Amen. You say, ask, mm -hmm. and it shall be given. Amen. Seek, and, and you shall find. Amen. And so if we really want to change, and we want to, to be better, or be something more than we are today, if we give our heart to, to Christ, he's not a man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should repent. Amen. And he say, all that come unto me, he said that he will relieve your burdens. Amen. He said he'll heal the sick. He said he'll set at liberty all those that are bruised. Yes. And the word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. And if you believe it, you can receive it. And so at this time, Mr. Cornelius, just share a little bit of information on how people may be able to contact you uh, as far as your website or your email or your phone number. And somebody might be able to contact you and they might be just looking for some encouragement from you or uh, letting them know that they can do it. You could be a model for someone that just may need to just say, I want to go by and just talk to him and just see how he really did this thing. Because I just heard his testimony, and I know God is able. He's able to help me. He has no respect or person. Well, God put me on this corner, <clears throat> I'm sure, for more than just to sell cars. Amen. And I'm at the corner of 15th and Gamp, Suite 707. Mm -hmm. yeah, stop by and say hi, or you're looking for a vehicle. We could probably get you into a vehicle. We do in-house financing. Amen. And you can find us at... Uh, CornegasOutofAlaska.com <clears throat> and as far as, as far as asphalt or landscaping or anything like that, our website is GodAsphalt. Well, that is net. something. Repeat that. GodAsphalt. God asphalt. Dot net. Now, you know that has to be a blessed business. Yes. Putting God first. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cornelius, for your time, taking out Thank time. You. Uh, for this Black History Month, just being an encouragement to those. Uh, it's for anybody. We know that Martin Luther King, he died for all races of people, but we know that he was a black man and he fought for equality for all people. And I just wanted to just interview some people with various businesses because there was a time when black people just couldn't own businesses. And we have come a long ways. And I want to thank you for joining us again on another segment of Let's Talk Real Talk. And just friend us on Facebook, connect with us, and follow us, even subscribe to us on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel, as well as checking us out on GCI Cable Channel 18 on Wednesday nights. Thank you for your time, and God bless. We now revisit King's celebrated I Have a Dream speech delivered on August 28, 1963, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic 
shadow we stand today, signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. And so we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. And so we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time <laughs> to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time make justice a reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment, this sweltering summer of the Negro's legitimate discontent will not pass until there is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. 
1963 is not an end, but a beginning. Those who hope that the Negro needed to blow off steam and will now be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. There will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. But that is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice in the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. And the marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the Negro community must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. And they have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the vi victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied. As long as our bodies, heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied, and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I am not my unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. Some of you have come from areas where your quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering 
continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama. Go back to South Carolina. Go back to Georgia. Go back to Louisiana. Go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities. Knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friend, <laughs> so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. And every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain. And the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is a faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith. We will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day, this will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tears of thee. Sweet land of liberty of thee I sing, land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring, and if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. 
But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring, and when this happens, and when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. That is, of course, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivering his iconic speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial on August 28, 1963.